Okay, so let me tell you about Spinnaker 2. Um, I've titled this a platform for real-time bio-inspired AI and cognition. And of course, all this work is together with uh, the Manchester guys, with Steve Ferber and this team. So I won't bore you with that slide, uh, especially since we are a neuromorphic crowd here. Um, just uh, to give you kind of my take on, on neuromorphic, which is kind of similar to what Mike or Brad have also been saying. So I started out with neuromorphics with the single neurons and synapse stuff. These days I take a slightly more abstract view. So I believe a lot in sparsity, that you code the problem sparsely, that at every point in your network, you try to really compress the information you're passing on to the absolute minimum. Um, and that you basically yeah, have this driven by the training. So basically from the task you really want to do, the bare minimum of information at every part in your network, that that's you solve the task which of course then gives you uh, either latency or energy improvements. Then you have to have a hardware that's actually can take advantage of the sparsity, which is not trivial. So you want all of this to be energy proportional, like um, AR protocols or advanced versions of that, that you basically not like HPC computing links, take time to uh, take energy to balance the link the entire time, irrespective of what you're transmitting. Same goes for computation, same goes for memory accesses. Then the brain constantly adapts and predicts, which actually make it very robust because yeah, prediction helps you to adjust to the real world. And it's also efficient. We have a number of examples, networks, where the prediction kind of tries to predict what the sensor data is doing. And uh, essentially you only give updates from the sensor when the prediction is running away. So that's not quite predictive encoding. Uh, it's a slightly larger concept, but um, having prediction in there, which the brain is actually doing, also helps you to make your uh, circuits more efficient. And of course, the brain is highly parallel and asynchronous. So compared to regular D deep neural networks, whatever, um, it just scales a lot better. So we're also on the track to kind of merge DNNs and SNNs uh, on this asynchronous level to have kind of partially asynchronous DNNs. And there is various higher level concepts like gating, like uh, saccades, which basically are region of interest selection in the eye that we're trying to take over on an algorithmic as well as on a hardware level. Okay, so Spinnaker 1, I think you're all pretty much aware of that. Um, so it's ARM-based, so the neurons and synapses run as code in the cores. It's 1 million cores, um, and it's basically organized in the storage structure, and it's inherently real-time, basically meaning um, the longest hop distance between any of those two processor nodes in the torus is below a millisecond. And the cores themselves also have a kind of built in into the software stack and hardware millisecond time scale, which basically says you can put in some sensor data at one point in the torus, have it transmitted, have it worked upon inside the millisecond. And let's say hook up some actor at the other side of the torus and have it react in real time. That's also why you don't need a lot of synchronization overhead in here compared to HPC. It's fairly popular as robotics, for example, so small scale systems, and there's about 40, 50 groups in the world that use it. And for Spinnaker 2, the uh, target was pure capacity enhancement by a factor better 10. So we achieved more like 30 to 40 with the accelerators. Then of course, keep the programmability. So very flexible neurons, very complex plasticity and yeah, graded events. So basically not just yeah, one bit communication that you usually get in, in neuromorphics and add various accelerators for deep neural networks, RNNs, spiking neural networks, sparse information processing. And the idea is to kind of merge the brain inspiration and deep neural networks at all levels from the processor to the network, to the algorithms. So what's in Spinnaker 2? So we put in uh, DVFS and power shutoff. So that's dynamic voltage frequency scaling for each single core, which essentially means the core can access um, two power levels and it decides on its own according to the activity that's coming in, basically at what supply level, what voltage, and what uh, operating frequency, clock frequency needs to run it inside the next millisecond to basically be able to react in real time. So it has a kind of prediction model of compute cycles that according to the neuron, the synapse model it's running, it needs that and that many clock cycles to basically compute away the incoming activity, and that's then what it runs at. And it goes in power shutoff basically if, uh, if it's done or in standby mode. 
Then there's memory sharing all across the machines. So essentially all the SRAM across all the 70,000 chips can be accessed via the network on chip from any chip. So essentially it's all one homogeneous array, but it's also for example means and it's separate in its power domain. So let's say you've got one of the chips with 150 cores, you could actually just do your neurons and synapses in one single core if they're very memory intensive and use just the SRAM from the rest of the chip because the chip is anyways 85% uh, SRAM. So um, basically this goes a little bit in the direction of what Mike Davis was saying earlier. Um, this is our way to at least bend this kind of memory uh, constraints a little bit. Then there's multiple accumulate accelerators. I don't think I need to tell you anything about those. This is run of the mill kind of deep neural network acceleration with some small tests that make it kind of sparse effective, but yeah. Then there's no morphic accelerator, so exp and log. And there is what I mentioned earlier in the chat um, uh, when um, Brad gave his talk, uh, random number generators, true random and pseudo random based on, so true random is based on the thermal noise from the clock generators. So it's basically zero overhead, the clock generators we anyways have. Then there's network on chip. Um, as I said, it's all geared towards this kind of asynchronous um, event-based protocols, so very efficient at that. Um, it's custom designed. In the older Spinnaker one, it was more of a adapting of industry standard protocols, um, but even the communication links, everything that's running between the chips is now our own designs down to the single transistor. And then there's adaptive body biasing, which I will tell you a bit more on the next slide. Come on, there we go. Um, so that's developed by one of our spin-off companies of the chair, um, the channel partner of Global Foundries, especially for uh, 22 and 12 FDX. Um, and it's essentially a way to have a hardware performance monitor running in real time besides the cores and essentially across temperature variations, aging variations um, and manufacturing variations uh, to weed out VTH variations. So essentially you can drive your cores way down in, um, in the so near threshold operation um, for the supply level. And for example, this has allowed them to achieve um, world record um, energy efficiency on microcontrollers um, about two or three years back. So that's the kind of technology at the lowest level that we're using to essentially get kind of um, 12 nanometer or even 10 nanometer FinFET performance out of 22 FDSOI. So we're quite competitive on that as well. Okay, so let me lay out for you. So Spinnaker 2 will be 16 racks, 70,000 chips, um, 10 million cores. It will be the largest real-time brain simulation platform worldwide. So that's three petaflops in the CPU and 0.4 XOPS in the AI accelerators. And it's essentially hybrid design, deep neural networks and spiking neural networks in the accelerators. And we can do symbolic AI, for example, in the cores and software on top of that. We actually have models that go in this direction. We clock mark, uh, benchmark the uh, prototypes we had so far against several commercial systems. And especially in real-time AI, we basically outperform them. For example, in uh, NVIDIA GPUs, they always assume batch processing which they are efficient at, but then of course you already take time to just load the batches, which we don't need to do here. Yes, then we support all the sparsity operation. And yeah, one of the most uh, interesting examples that we're going to do is of course large scale brain modeling on the machine, or let's say the brains of robots. So this is, if you recognize it, it's Amika from the Internet Arts people in uh, the UK. And we actually started a cooperation with them. They are very keen on Spinnaker too. So um, basically Spinnaker 2 dotted across the robot as well as running the brain of the robot kind of inside the machine and having the Amica robot besides it. There's actually a commercial customer for this kind of combined system. Right, so from the algorithm side, um, we are also working on a framework that basically runs from the edge nodes, from the sensors all the way to our big machine. So essentially having kind of trainable sparse extractors with event output right at the edge. So think of a very intelligent version of a dynamic vision sensor where you can do all kinds of extraction, kind of wavelets or yeah, whatever you want, uh, uh, quantization in time, in space. And this is all transparent to the training. So essentially the training trains the entire network and tells the extractors actually what it needs. 
um, for, to solve the task from the streaming sensor data. Um, and then, of course, there's subsequent steps where we do feed forward and recurrent neural networks. So this is really kind of uh, at the application level, this is real neurons, but used in a kind of event-based fashion to do, for example, this is what you see on the right-hand side, uh, pixel level um, person tracking. And yeah, we call those chips uh, that we're designing the spin edge um, ASICs. So the spin edge, uh, it's sp uh, sparse pre-processing neural network acceleration for edge applications. And we currently have in the lab um, uh, stuff for radar, stuff for biomedical. Um, the audio um, will have tape out later this year. The robotic just had tape out and the video in the conceptual stage. So basically domain specific pre-processing and lower levels of this event-based processing custom chips essentially that hook up to these kind of specific sensors. And on the algorithm level, we are working with INI Bochum on what they call EVNN or EGRU. So that's basically event-based RNNs and DNNs for these kind of distributed AI applications. They um, basically tune the level of sparsity. Not to get into too much detail on that. So let me give you the current state for Spinnaker 2 and the outlook. So we had the full mass tape out done in Global Foundries 22 FTX um, last May, um, which basically you guys are wondering what we've been doing since then. Um, this was the engineering run. So we only had uh, three wafers manufactured to check out the chip um, if we can really go for the full production run based on the same mask set. Um, and yeah, it took some while to package them. Then November, actually, we had them back in the lab, did rapid fire. Um, qualification on those, everything is fine with the chips, no major bugs found. So we now ordered the production batch, which is basically 45K chips. So a half size machine for now, that's about the limit of the funding. We have actually ongoing construction where Spinnaker 2 will be housed. So that's water cooling, uh, power supplies, floor strengthening, <laughs> yeah, all kinds of weird things. And yeah, so lab test successful, production test is ongoing. And the rec, le uh, rec level machine operational will be about end of this year, beginning of 23. We do have some supply chain issues, which actually pushed the machine out half a year, same as everybody else. We're not getting the components for the boards. That's our main bottleneck. So Ethernet files, DC, DC converters, et cetera, just to populate the boards at this level, basically to supply those 45K uh, spinning out chips. It's not been easy. We actually have subcontracted companies that specialize in this kind of, um, yeah, basically getting supply chains working for semiconductor components. And I tried to count the people involved. I stopped at 100, actually. Um, I think it's significantly more. So across Dresden, Manchester, our spin of Racix, Global Foundries, Cloud and Heat, which is the rec level planning, Uniquify, it's a company in Silicon Valley that's doing the LPDD4 interface custom for us, then Armcore for the packaging, four source for the supplies, construction companies. Um, this is one major coordination shop actually for a small university group like mine. So results, plenty of results. So on the prototypes, we've got, for example, synaptic sampling running. So that's the most complex plasticity rule ever on a normorphic chip. Then we've got deep R and E prop as yeah, uh, competition event-based versions of backprop essentially. We do have the most efficient implementation of the neural engineering framework that's published so far. And with Infineon, BMW, Volkswagen, Bosch, et cetera, we're doing automotive radar processing, robotics and tactile stuff on the machines. And yeah, this is just, I won't bore you reading the table, but this is the typical performance stuff we get across the cores and across the accelerators. Software-wise, um, so of course we will part. Um, we will port the software framework from Spinnaker One. So basically, you will have a Pi and N backend. Um, so that's ongoing right now. The adaptation of the low-level software and the availability early 23 for the 48 node boards. Um, this summer for the single chip systems, and then of course we scale it up to the full machine. So that's Pi and N just for the kind of neuroscience spiking stuff you do on the machine. Then we actually have a BMBF project application with the Intel guys from Munich, with uh, Julia and also Mike um, on Lava integration. So if the project comes, very likely you will have Lava integration of Spinnaker 2. 
Then um, we use the Apache TVM stack um, and build a backend for that for DNN processing, DNN RNN, which uses, of course, the inherent accelerators in Spinnaker 2. And it can, being TVM, it accepts different front ends, so TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera. And yeah, software development that is also ongoing, expected in the next half year, first deployment. And then, of course, uh, what I think is this machine is really built for is this kind of hybrid SNN DNN. Um, we don't have a perfect software backend for that yet. No one supports it as of now. So right now we have a lightweight Python interface that basically tries to use the accelerators on a fairly native level. Um, and you just yeah, build your combined DNN SNN stack from that. And for example, Infineon is working a lot with that, the local AI center here in Dresden. Okay, that already brings me to the outlook. Bjorn, I'm saving you time, I think. <laughs> um, so outlook one would be the Spinnaker two award. So um, there's a foundation local one that allows us to offer a yearly reward of two times 40K euro uh, for one year projects, showing of Spinnaker two capabilities. And it's actually not much of a chore. You're basically writing a two page outline. Uh, so all in all you're ever writing is two pages. Then we have a selection committee and yeah, that awards the two prizes. And then you basically do stuff with us on Spinnaker 2 for the following year. So um, current projects are running. So the one is with ABR. The other one is with Emre Nefci, who's now in Jülich. Um, and of course, um, we don't yet know when we offer the next round, so look out for the announcements, uh, but it will be probably in summer for this next round of awards. So that will be on a yearly basis from now on. Then there's further outreach. So we will integrate Spinnaker 2 with eBrains. So you'll also get an access via eBrains. Then we will have together with the Manchester guys, same as they now do for Spinnaker 1, there will be Spinnaker 2 workshops. And of course we will, Capocaccia we don't quite make with the system, but tell you right this summer, we will have systems uh, either physically there or remotely accessible and some of our people on site. So yeah, if you're not signed up for Telluride, then I invite you and you get your first glance at Spinnaker 2. Then Outlook 2, um, we have Spin Cloud Systems. That's a new spin-off out of my chair. That's now number four. Um, and they are basically commercializing Spinnaker 2. So there's customers, um, I'm not quite saying lining up, there is serious commercial interest. So um, we were actually pushed into making this company in a sense. Um, and they are mainly focusing on smart city that's also driven by the early customers, but they are branching out the usual stuff, industry 4.0, um, autonomous driving, et cetera, et cetera. So that's it startup and Outlook 3 would be um, the highlights of the Spinnaker 2 machine at TU Dresden. So we do deploy Spinnaker 2 at Dresden with an 8 million grant from EFRE, uh, respectively from the local science ministry. Um, so that's where the money comes from because HPP just funded the development, uh, but not the deployment basically. Um, the machine we will have in Dresden is integrated into one of those federal German AI supercomputing centers. In this case, it's guts.ai. So there's five centers spread out across Germany that do AI supercomputing. <clears throat> and the local one basically integrates Spinnaker 2. The machine is already, or basically the prototypes, and then the machine is heavily used by the Infineon AI Center, which is located in Dresden. And um, you might be aware that there's um, this coal kind of region restructuring funding that's coming locally um, in the Lausitz region. So that's across the federal states of Brandenburg and um, Saxony. And um, there is application round two for that now. This will be big research dash supercomputing centers. And um, we are heavily involved with most of those applications. So it's highly likely that the machine in Dresden won't be the only local one. If I count this up, it might run up to five Spinnaker 2 machines just locally across Brandenburg and Saxony uh, in Lausitz and Leipzig and in Cottbus. For the prototypes, there's already a user network of about 40 partners. So that's from John Hopkins, UCI, Oakley, ABR, et cetera. And yes, usage, you've all seen it. Um, Real-time AI at high data rates on the application case, of course. I also very much support the neuroscience stuff. So we will do stuff like multi-scale uh, brain models on the machine, which I think also Spinnaker 2 is very good for, 
because uh, let's say you do mesoscopic approximations of parts of your brain, you might actually train a DNN just for the IO relationship and have that running as a black box model on there. And then on the ARM cores, you could be running as point neurons or multi-compartment neurons or the real neurons uh, just to have rate approximations. So you can actually model the brain even at several uh, different levels of abstraction. Yeah, further use cases, uh, ultra-fast drug screening we're exploring with a partner, uh, medical eye processing, quantum computing emulation, actually. Um, there's an announcement on LinkedIn, if you see that. <coughs> so we will be hooked up with a quite large-scale quantum computer in future and see what the combined machine can do. And we actually already started roadmap planning for Spinnaker 3, that's on the academic side, or Spinnaker 2 Pro on the uh, commercial side, so kind of refined commercial version of Spinnaker 2. And with that, I actually leave you with a side from Rafael Laguna de la Vera, who's heading up the Sprinde, so that's the German version of DARPA. And he's basically saying Spinnaker 2 is inherently disruptive. So there's also been big supporters of our machine. <clears throat> yep. So thanks for your attention.